when you're changing, uh, we're going to talk about brushless motors this time because it's a little more applicable, is doubling our pole count. So we're going to go from a two pole motor to a four pole motor. And I'm essentially going to just draw a cross section of a motor and say, okay, we're going to change some, some variations on this and then show you why essentially doubling the pole count of a motor will double your torque output. It's not perfect world like that, but that, that's essentially what happens as long as we can deal with the torque output and the RPM range output of our system. So now our rotor would be rotating in this direction. I would draw it circular, but it actually gets confusing and it's more for me to draw. So we have a couple of components in a motor. We of course have our magnets and we have our copper windings. And in most cases we have steel. We need some sort of steel to conduct on the backside and make a full circuit with our copper and our magnets essentially. We want a full conduction of that magnetic field. So we're gonna have rotor in the middle or you know, at the bottom in this case. We're gonna have back iron, which is uh, usually considered the stator on a brushless motor. Back iron's gonna be at the top. That's pretty much where it sits in here. And I'm gonna mostly ignore teeth, but I'll draw some representations of them right here. And then we got our coils. And our coils would be essentially in here. And these coils on the outside would, would be the same. And this is a uh, three slot, two pole motor. And I realized I made the rotor much too small. <laughs> so we'll just extend some of these. Big old teeth. There we go. Much better. All right. So, really, how this all works is flux density. When you are running an electric motor, the magnets are only so strong. The back iron, this portion that conducts, is only so strong. So, what will happen, and I'll use another color here, is we have our magnetic flux coming out of the rotor, and it's going to go through a tooth. And then it has to conduct through our back iron, back through the tooth. And this is a, a very poor representation of it because it would actually be connected to the back side. But when you have a two pole motor, uh, and really any motor, your flux density, you don't want to push past 1.2 Teslas in your back iron. This is just a constant that we kind of work with as a motor designer. You go past that, things saturate, the more amps you push in, you don't even get anything more out of it. So you, that, that's just kind of a design constraint that we all have. Too strong of a magnet, it's not going to help you out because your back iron is saturated, so you know that is what it is. What happens is that we have let's say four, <coughs> four lines of flux, four lines of flux is saturated. If we double our pull count, we would essentially be moving everything in half, so we, we don't just have one north and south. And I realize now that I should have drawn this as a full circle to get the full representation of it. But we split it in half, so instead of having one big north on top, one big south on bottom, we have a north and a south on top, and north and south on bottom. So we essentially, we split our flux in half. The flux density of this back iron also gets split in half. Now we only have two flux lines. And we can consider this back iron now waste space. If you're not saturated all the way, then what are you doing with it? just not working for us, right? So what we can do when we double our pole count is that we can actually move this back iron and, and we can thin it by half. So what we would end up doing, we, we essentially have two options. One option is to deepen our stator teeth right here, and this is starting to get messy, but uh, we, would, we would cut this in half, we could move it up here, and then we would have more room for copper now. Alternatively, we could move this back iron up, we could move our teeth up by the exact same amount, and we would have more room for magnets, one way or another. You double your pole count, and you now have more room for active materials on the inside, just because we've got that, uh, that flux efficiency essentially in the back side. Now, this isn't a free meal, of course, because when you double your pole count, you also cut your RPMs in half, and as we saw in this example, when you spend more RPMs, you make more power. It also makes more torque in, in this particular case but there's really no free lunch on here. Uh, again, we have to use the same gear down of the rigs that we have. We have to use the voltages that are available to us, and of course, we want the wheel speed out the back end. 
if you go too high, you know, doubling your pole count, doubling your pole count, doubling your pole count, your motor won't spin fast enough to be useful. So we can't have, you know, uh, 100 pole pairs or anything like that and still have a useful motor. And there's also de design constraints of, of actually, you know, assembling it, winding it, everything. So we just can't go on and on forever doubling our torque density by doubling the pole count. The, really what ends up happening is you can't quite double everything. And the reason for that is when we make the rotor, I'm going to switch colors on here. When we make a rotor, we have to have a shaft supporting everything. And when we put our magnets in, there's going to be a little bit of separation between the magnets. The reason why we have some separation between the magnets is twofold. The first one is that there's going to be a little bit of variation to our manufacturing of the magnets. If you have them all butted up against each other, a little bit of variation there, you're always going to get a gap somewhere, or they're not going to actually fit. You know, if they're a little bit oversized, they're not going to fit. If they're, if they're a little bit undersized, you get a gap. And so your rotor kind of gets a little wonky. Your flux coming out of the motor gets wonky. The startup gets wonky. And in general, it's just a bad idea. It's poor engineering. So what we end up having is a stator support with little bitty teeth right here. This is also technically the back iron behind the magnets. We have back iron in the center of the motor and on the back side because we have to have a full flux connecting the parts together. And uh, it, it's kind of cool. It's hard to draw out. Uh, I wish I had like, you know, some fancy diagrams for y'all. But the way that it works is pretty cool. But this, this space right here, this gap is pretty much a constant. Uh, the second reason why we need this gap, if these magnets are butted up next to each other, we will get shorts. We will get magnetic shorts between the magnets because they don't want to jump you know, all the way over this iron. And I've got this buddy right next to me. And I can just connect magnetically to it. That's a lot easier. That's a less distance to go. So you end up having dead shorts in your magnets if they're too close to each other. And that's not doing any work for us. That's just shorting out. You know, that's like putting two magnets together and uh, you, know, you can't use that flux anymore. They're coupled, essentially. So this gap between our, our you know, the, the teeth, essentially, on the uh, stator support, this gap is one reason why when you double your poles that you don't quite get double the torque out of. Because this is dead space too. You know, this is inactive motor area. The other reason that it doesn't quite work out is when these coils are wound on their stator, there's got to be some insulation, right? You got to insulate so that they don't short out against the stator. And this insulation is pretty much a constant thickness. We can't get any thinner. You know? We get it as thin as we possibly can, and it's pretty much optimized. I mean, how long have they been making electric motors now? 100 years or so, 130 years. If we could get it thinner, we absolutely would, but we can't. So here's a constant. We've got this insulation layer that is impeding us from adding more copper to be the tune of when we doubled our poles that we can't double you know, the, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll say it this way. The insulation has now doubled on our stator slots. So we have actually lost a little bit more room to put in copper. And that's why as you double and as you double and as you double, your power density goes down, down, down. Along with the max RPM of the motor being limited, that is actually one of the biggest issues that we have is we're losing our ability to put copper inside the motor. So, you know, it's not a free lunch. Uh, well, the moral of the story is that we have to work with the design constraints of, let's say, a 36 millimeter diameter motor, right? We have to work with the design constraints of how many RPMs our motor can turn because we have the gear down of our vehicle. We have a, you know, a certain amount of voltage that we can apply to it. So what we've really found in the industry is that the four pole is kind of the golden zone for having power and torque, having that drivability, and just being kind of an all around great motor. And it's really because of the gear down that we're working with and we have to you know, have a motor that spins 50,000 RPMs or, or something like that. If we double it to, let's say eight pole, well, we're not gonna get 50,000 RPMs anymore. We're gonna get 25,000 RPMs before the motor gets hot from switching losses, from the you know, loss of our copper density in there, or from loss of our magnets. You know, because as we double, we can actually get more room for magnets. We can get a larger rotor in there. That's usually where the torque actually comes from. But we still have this back iron that we got to deal with. Just because we have more room for magnets doesn't mean that we can push more force into that back iron. But, you know, always a balance of constraints. There's always a balance. Uh, so you know, I just kind of want to talk about that. Why doubling your pole counts will give you more torque density. I could get into the math a little bit more of why your power density usually goes down by more than half every time. But it's, uh, it's a really long road that I think I may get confused on myself as I'm going down. There's a lot, there's even more formulas uh, to juggle than that. Um, did I answer all of my own questions that I presented? Mm. <laughs>
I think I started asking questions, not keeping track of what I was asking. Uh, again, when the rubber hits, hits the road, it doesn't always work out cleanly. So, do y'all have any questions about that side of things? Like doubling pole counts, why we can do it? You know, like I said, we have that back iron. We get more space for magnets. We get more room for uh, for copper. Uh, let, let me say this. The reason why castle motors are very power dense is because when they have that back iron thickness, they use all of the copper in there. That's why they're so power dense. They have really low phase resistance because they use copper. Mine, I put more magnet in there instead. So you can't just bolt, bolt, bolt on mine and think that they're not going to get into saturation because you know there's not as much copper in there. But for the use of crawlers, when hey, we're not going 80 miles an hour all the time, it works out just fine. Having that torque dense motor ends up working. Uh, the, you know, that's pretty much the two ways you can go. You can go with a copper-based motor, you can go with a magnet-based motor. There's drawbacks to both of them, but uh, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat or to drive a crawler. All <laughs> so. right, so back, back to the question of, do y'all have any questions on this? I, I feel like I maybe ran some circles on this one, but... Uh, right. Well, the, uh, when you go to a higher pole count, typically you can get better torque density. But if you're not taking advantage of the back iron space and adding more magnets or adding more copper, you're actually losing torque density and power density, mostly because of these teeth on your rotor. You're losing space to put magnets in. Uh, I can tell you that all the six poles on the market today did not uh, cut their back iron by 50% compared to a four pole. They did not increase their rotor size at all. And uh, so the, the golden zone for a two pole motor to be able to produce torque and power is between a 12 and 14 millimeter rotor. The back iron on them, I can tell you, is five millimeters for a two pole, the average two pole motor. So when we go to a four pole, we have two and a half millimeters back iron now. We've gained five millimeters of internal space in our motor. If we increase our rotor size and we go from a 12 millimeter rotor to a 17 millimeter rotor, because we have that extra five millimeters inside, uh, my point is, what are most four pole rotors these days? 17 millimeters. It's not by chance that that is what they settled on because that was exactly what they got in back iron room by doubling the poles. Uh, so if you see a six pole motor and uh, you know if we go to four pole, it's gonna be 17, 18 millimeters. That's kind of the golden zone for four pole motor. If we go to a six pole motor, it should be 20 millimeters plus, 20 to 22 millimeters, 23, but of course we start getting into issues of you know running into insulation problems we're taking up more space with insulation we're taking up more space with uh, you know these teeth that, that keep all the magnets spaced out we're, we're still losing power density we're still losing torque density if we don't make that big old rotor in there to compensate i'm not aware of any six poles that have between 20 and 22 millimeter rotor on there uh, there there is one stator that i'm aware of but it's not used in the rc industry uh, and, uh, it doesn't have very good power density either it's always a trade-off. There's always that trade-off there. So, uh, it, at least in my opinion, for end runners, the six pole so far in a 36 millimeter diameter motor has not been optimized. Not to say it couldn't be optimized, but from what I've seen, there's not one out there that beats a four pole. Uh, it's always a power density hit and a torque density hit right now because the design considerations have not been pulled. Now, if we go, you know, way far down the line, we just talk about 14 pole motors, the outrunners. Now our rotor is on the outside of the motor, so we get pretty much as much torque as we could possibly cram into that 36 millimeter space. And the reason why we can pull more torque is that our, our phase resistance goes down every time we double our uh, pull count, we get that lower phase resistance, but of course we're limited on our RPM again, so our power goes down. And for the same KV of motor, that outrunner, that 14 pole is gonna make all kinds of torque. You know, uh, an, an average outrunner, like one of my revolver 1800s, produces six times the amount of torque as a brush motor, and eh, about twice the amount of torque as a four pole, but the power that it makes is way down. Of course, there's plenty of power for crawlers, plenty of power for crawlers. But if we're gonna put them on a dyno and see you know, which one could do hot laps forever in a racer, I'm not gonna put an outrunner in there because it is so power limited that we're gonna overheating, trying to push 40 miles an hour all day. And that, that's always the trade-off. When you get more torque out of a system, you lose that power density. And there's really nothing that we can do about it. Now, uh, Way back when, Castle had a two-pole motor that they made that had both more torque and power than a four-pole, but the startup was horrendous. Like, started up at uh, it's like 5,000 RPM when it hit, just bam, you're going. And of course, Roar got wind of it and it immediately made their stator shape illegal 
Yeah, you, know, you know, before they get to it. But this was a motor that you had to spend like 200,000 RPM yeah. at the same time. It wasn't exactly optimized for the gear down, but it was just, you know, just a monster. Just an absolute monster. Uh, but they ended up balancing it out, you know, going with four poles, and they kind of stepped out of the two pole market there. Always interesting to see what other companies come up with and what they can push on their own design constraints. They're a company that can come out with their own standard if they want to. And at that point, if you can come out with your own standard, you can optimize it for whatever you want to do, which is really nice. Of course, within that could be if you have more torque, usually you end up losing power and, and vice versa. So uh, those two poles, though, if you can spin them fast enough, man, they can be some really ripping motors. But if you, the startup, I mean, we couldn't use them, obviously, in, in the uh, crawling world. If, if you, like the startup at all at least is, uh, there's, there's that balance but again uh, my takeaway that I'd like to say on this is for an in-running man that four pole it's hard to beat that golden time it is just about optimized for everything and you know I could recommend you a, a four pole out of my van or a four pole from another company and say it doesn't really matter what you're gonna do as long as this meets your smoothness and your RPM requirements that uh, you just throw it in there don't even worry about it it's gonna be plenty for, plenty for anybody even a, even a big old hauler over here with 50 pound guys you know, man, some amazing rigs today. Uh, just uh, want to say the variation that we see out here, all, all the different types of rigs. Uh, I really like to, to get the questions on rigs. You know, what, what should I put in this that uh, little, you know, stumps me a little bit, maybe? That's, that's always good times. So, uh, any other questions? I know I just probably rambled in another circle there. <laughs> Let's see, how are we doing on time? Wow, I actually talked for 45 minutes. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't have an outline. I'm kind of surprised that. <laughs> if you guys like the channel and want to help it out a little bit, you can click that join button and that should become a channel member. Members get special privileges, maybe even some member giveaways. So make sure you check that out. And as always, subscribe, like, and share. Thank you guys for watching.